let's wrap up tonight with a talk about designing perennial flower gardens. Our speaker, Don Kinsler, is a native of Lisbon, North Dakota, and he's been a lifelong gardener. Don is the NDSU Extension Agent for Horticulture in Cass County. He's quite the busy man. He writes two weekly gardening columns. He hosts weekly programs on two radio stations during the growing season. And Don loves to talk about gardening. Don, welcome to the forums. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, everyone. It's great to be here this evening, and I am excited to talk about perennials this evening. Now, we're going to talk um, especially primarily about designing a perennial garden, uh, and uh, maybe next year, a part two of this could be talking about specific perennial types. So we aren't going to talk a whole lot about specific perennials. We're going to talk especially about ways that we can get our perennial flower bed to look a little nicer and just kind of a little, um, you know, a little more pizzazz to it. Now, oftentimes when we see perennial gardens, maybe you've toured ones, when we see a well put together per perennial garden, we kind of, we just know it. And so I'm going to talk about some of the tips that people specifically can use to make their perennials a little better. Now, I couldn't resist putting in a few different types of perennials, of course, just to kind of whet our appetite. Now, it's going to be so fun. In May, when the bleeding hearts bloom, and then the end of May and into June, the peonies will be uh, fully out, just wonderful. Then in June, the iris are going to be blooming, and followed by daylilies in the middle of summer. And now daylilies, got to pause for a minute on these. Daylilies, if you think about the old-fashioned varieties that weren't all that nice, small flowers, a little bit on the weedy side, or the little short Stella Diora daylilies that maybe we're getting kind of tired of that are in front of every dentist office around, but uh, do consider daylilies because they are they have made such nice improvements. One of my favorites is the one photoed here called Buttered Popcorn. What a wonderful name for a daylily, Buttered Popcorn. Huge blossoms. I've got quite a few plants of that one. A Spider-Man, great big, huge red blossoms. And um, there's even pink frilly types. So daylilies, a little something for everybody. And then even true lilies growing, grown from a bulb blow. Uh, some of the types are hardier than others, but even in our uh, zones four, zone three, with a little bit of protective mulch in the fall, some of these beautiful type trumpet lilies will bloom well also. And of course, then in the fall of the year, perennials have a lot to offer, such as these mammoth mums. Now, mammoth is the cult of our name. The mammoth series was developed in Minnesota, University of Minnesota, and wonderful. Um, these are the, some of the hardiest of the mum varieties, and they're blooming when the snow flies in uh, November, December. So again, the mammoth cultivar of mums, available in a few different uh, colors and styles. And so there are perennials for all four seasons. And that's one of the charms of perennial flowers is that we have spring blooming perennials, summer blooming perennials in the fall of the year. It's amazing when we kind of think maybe there isn't a whole lot going on in a perennial garden, just the, the shades of brown, the, um, the mums, of course, the different seed heads, the ornamental grasses. There's a lot of nice things going on in the perennial garden in fall of the year. And yes, even in wintertime. You know, it's interesting. Our winter landscapes uh, with the snow covered, when the tops, and we're going to talk about leaving the above ground portions on. We're going to talk about that later. But when the tops are left on like that, there's a lot of beauty. When you look out of your window onto the winter landscape, there's beauty to be had. So there's a lot of good to say about perennial gardens. So let's talk about some of the specifics, the steps in how to design a perennial flower garden so that it's going to look really, really nice. Okay, so first of all, whether or not you have a, an existing flower garden or you're going to start from brand, brand new, we should start with a survey of the area. We should get the dimensions so you know exactly the size of the area that you're working with. And of course, know whether it's sun, part, uh, part sun, part shade, 
that's going to determine what types of perennials do best in that area. And a soil test that will tell the pH, uh, tell the organic matter, tell what your the natural fertility is of the soil. So um, check with your county offices, NDSU soil testing lab, and then know our hardiness zones. And of course, we're in zones three and zones four. So we choose perennials that are adapted to that. And we can fudge a little on some of these because we can give them winter uh, mulch protection. So some of the things we can push the hardiness a little, which is fun on perennials. And know whether the location that you're working with is exposed or microclimate. And I grew up at Lisbon. And uh, there's a big difference on what could be grown on a windy hillside uh, on the surrounding hills of Lisbon versus what could be grown down in the valley in an older established yard. So there's a difference in what we can plant. So the second item is to plan on paper. You know, sometimes we think, oh gosh, you know, paperwork. Uh, can't I just go buy, buy the things at the garden center that look nice and then kind of fill them in? Well, uh, that's not the best way to do it. The world's most famous perennial flower bed designer is a Dutchman by the name of Pete Audolf. And he has designed uh, famous perennial gardens all over the world. And he has, uh, his designs have kind of a naturalistic look that is currently a, a, a hot trend. And they look so very, very natural, don't they? But he carefully scripts those flower beds carefully. He puts on paper where every single plant is going to go. Uh, he also does not just seed them. Sometimes I'm asked, uh, can we plant a wildflower perennial mix? Um, but that doesn't really uh, create the nicest perennial flower garden, really starting from plants so you can locate and use these design principles. So it is easier, much easier to start with plants purchased from a garden center or get divisions from uh, friends and neighbors. And notice how he developed um, graceful sweeping curves. And so in our own perennial gardens, those sweeping curves make them look very natural. So thinking again about how you want to design a perennial garden, uh, when you kind of start trying to kind of put these ideas in into place, one thing you can do is create a mood board. And that is just get a, um, a poster type board. And when you see uh, nice perennial flowers that you like in a, um, in a magazine or online, just post them on there. It starts you kind of formulating what you would like your perennials to look like, your perennial bed. So third, I mentioned the four seasons of perennials, the four seasons of colors. So the fourth item is to intentionally plant perennial flowers that will give you that color during the four seasons. Now, when my wife and I had a garden, we had a garden center in South Fargo for 25 years. And we sometimes we would get customers that would come in and say, well, I'd like a perennial flower uh, and I'd like it to bloom the whole summer. And in a variety of colors would be nice too. Well, that one hasn't been created yet. Perennials have their certain specific season of bloom. So if we choose those that um, are labeled for spring blooming, early summer, midsummer, fall, etc., and we can even add some winter color with shrubs such as the high bush cranberry. So next, to make a perennial flower bed most interesting, we can use a variety of flower types. Uh, we can do spike shapes, round, flat, mound shaped. Do you see how the combination of flower forms gives interest to that? And ornamental grasses. The locally owned garden centers have so many different types of ornamental grasses. I think we've all seen the Carl Forrester grass that is in front of, uh, you know, so many uh, businesses, dentist office, etc. But there are so many more interesting types. And adding ornamental grasses give such a kind of a movement to the perennial flower bed. Notice here in the fall how pretty those are. It just gives, it gives a totally different uh, texture and structure to that. And when you're planting groupings of a of type of flower, in nature, we most often see odd numbers. 
rather than a symmetrical even number. So numbers of three, five, seven. For example, I mentioned um, I mentioned buttered popcorn daylily. So to create a little more impact, instead of just one buttered popcorn daylily, I planted a grouping of three. So when those are blooming, they have greater impact. The next point is to repeat groupings. Now, I mentioned that each of the different perennial types has a certain bloom period during the season. And so when, for example, those uh, blue uh, salvia are blooming, when they're blooming, if we locate a number of groups throughout the perennial bed, then at that time, um, the, the bed is more complete, if you follow me. We don't just have them blooming in one corner, but instead we have a continuity blooming throughout the perennial garden. Or when the, when the iris are blooming in June, if you locate iris throughout the perennial bed, then you'll have iris going continually kind of throughout during that time that they're blooming, of course. The next concept is to use assorted heights in the perennial garden. Now, of course, we, we're all familiar with uh, you plant the short things in front, the medium things in the middle, and the tall things in back. But if you follow that too religiously, it can look kind of too um, unnatural. Instead, don't be afraid to locate some of the taller things towards the front, such as those pink flocks. Now, naturally, we're not going to put a short thing behind where it's going to be um, where it's going to be hidden. But uh, if we pull some of the taller material a little towards the front and then put taller yet yeah, things behind that. But you see the way it gives kind of a dynamic, just an interesting, uh, an interesting kind of movement or uh, it, it avoids a rigidity that if you stick too religiously to short in front, medium, then tall. So use assorted heights. And um, when you're choosing perennials such as that with sorted heights, there are kind of two types of perennials based on how long they live. Some perennials live very, very long and some don't live quite as long. And when I say long lived, some live you know, 100 years. Some types of perennials only live three, four, five years, but they're still very good worth using. So the key here is to, when you're designing a perennial flower garden, create a backbone of the long-lived types. And when I say long-lived peonies, uh, when we plant those now, they'll be there a hundred years if all goes well easily. Or iris, they do beautifully. The day lilies that I mentioned, the true lilies, uh, the bulbs underneath, you can dig, divide, uh, give them some winter protection, they'll do fine. And flocks, many, many more. So we create a backbone of those long-lived sturdy types. And then we can add types that are shorter lived, you know, three, four, five years. And then it seems we need to replant them in our North Dakota, Minnesota areas, but they're still very much worth planting because they're so beautiful. In this uh, category are the things like the coneflowers, well worth planting, even though they aren't gonna live probably a hundred years, they're still well worth it. Monarda is in that category, the bee balm and Coreopsis, beautiful perennials, very much worth using, even though they're not gonna last quite as long as the others. The next concept is to make sure that we space plants to allow for their, their mature footprint so they don't get too crowded. So make sure that uh, a peony that's gonna be at least three foot in diameter, make sure when you're spacing your plants that you give it that three foot or more footprint so they don't get things too crowded. Next is in addition to the perennials, don't be afraid to add ground covers, creeping junipers, shrubs. Notice how beautifully those white Annabelle hydrangeas, notice how well they go in a perennial flower bed. Isn't that pretty? And look beyond bloom. A perennial garden isn't all just about flowers, but there are foliage that's so interesting, like the blue fescue. There's fruit uh, in the winter there, the high bush uh, cranberry, viburnum, beautiful. Oftentimes the buds of different flowers are beautiful. And the shapes, the forms, uh, the ornamental grass there that's kind of um, flowing in the wind a little bit. So there's a lot going on there besides just the blossoms. <laughs> 
And some people even prefer to go as far as doing a color scheme. Uh, I'm not at that point yet. I kind of like more of a variety, but we could do a warm theme or a cool theme. In the perennial garden, such as the shade garden, great spot to add a container full of uh, full of annuals such as the coleus there. Notice how that container of annuals, uh, the coleus, gives a pop of color to that shade garden. And uh, speaking of annuals, if you leave a space in the perennial garden for some annuals, they give a great pop of color. And annuals, which tend to bloom all season long, all summer long, they tend to bridge the gaps when all when perennials might not be totally in bloom, the annuals tend to bridge those gaps. Also, look at the large container of sweet potato vine on the right hand of the screen. Isn't that pretty in amongst the perennials? And a comfort spot with a little bit of privacy. If you have enough room in your perennial garden, wouldn't that be nice? I've got a couple of benches in our own perennial garden, but I rarely find time to sit on them. Uh, there's, there's always lots to do in the garden, but at least I know if I've got a bench there, if I get done with all my chores, I can sit there. All right, sometimes the neighboring yard will give you a good uh, view. Uh, for example, here, the evergreens made a nice backdrop for these perennials. So if the neighbor has something good going on in theirs, maybe we can piggyback and use that as a background for our own. Oh, and I love this one. Patience is a must. Uh, perennials are a long-term project. Uh, when we had our garden center and we were designing perennial beds and doing landscaping, I always mentioned to, to customers uh, and when they planted their own, if your perennial garden looks wonderful the first season, you've done it wrong. Uh, perennials take time to fill out and establish such as peonies. Peonies easily take three, four years before they really develop enough of a crown to burst forth. In fact, I would rather on most perennials, I would rather take off the blossoms the first year or two, uh, especially something like peonies. Peonies are gonna be there for a hundred years. So let's let the strength go into creating a good, well-rooted uh, with a nice big crown. So patience, patience is definitely a virtue with perennials. And fun to add a piece of statuary in. These are kind of nice little touches that we can do in a perennial garden. Now, if you have an existing perennial bed, sometimes you have to decide what's going to stay and what's going to go if you want to redesign. And of course, I think this perennial bed, I think most of that's going to have to go. All right. And a good counterbalance for a, a perennial garden is a nice sweep of lawn. That makes a, just such a nice green kind of a canvas on which the perennial garden can be featured. Uh, and perennials love natural mulch. The natural mulch, such as shredded bark, uh, keeps the soil cool, keeps it moist, and perennials do so well. Um, rock, not so much. Uh, I know some perennials will grow in the in rock mulch uh, around um, commercial type buildings. But really what perennials want in our home yard is a natural mulch. And also, uh, okay, how we, what are we gonna put underneath that wood chip mulch? Well, if we use a fabric, uh, a landscape fabric, uh, sometimes that, that's difficult with a perennial bed because perennials you're digging, dividing, you're moving them around and that uh, fabric can oftentimes just be in the way of all that. So I'm not a big fan myself of using fabric under that mulch. Instead, here's a little secret. This is probably gonna sound a little funny. This is not my yard, but the concept is the same. Under, my, uh, under the shredded bark in our own uh, perennial garden, I use cardboard overlapped. It does a great job of smothering the weeds. It's going to decompose and turn into just, you know, kind of a mulchy wood type uh, stuff. It's going to decompose nicely and covered with shredded bark. You never know that it's under there. But then when I go to dig and divide uh, the perennials, uh, it, it's so much easier than if there was fabric under there. <laughs> 
And that fabric under there doesn't really allow the mulch always to do the, the job that it was intended. And of course, it's fun to have a path through the perennial garden so that you can kind of enjoy it uh, and get a little closer look. Notice here the way that plants have been repeated throughout. Isn't that pretty? That was This is one of the perennial gardens designed by that uh, the, the Dutch designer, Pete Oudolf, and beautiful job that he does. All right, here's another one of my favorites. I have really come to appreciate the browns of autumn. You know, when we think things are done, well, they aren't really done after frost. Look at how beautiful some of those are. You know, the textures, the seed heads, there's a lot of beauty in the fall. The sun starts getting low on the horizon, you get shadows, and there's a lot of beauty, natural beauty in that season. And I mentioned too, winter I think is very beautiful if you have those perennial gardens there. Now, a couple of things uh, beyond, uh, beyond the designing. And again, uh, I couldn't, there wasn't time to discuss too many of like my favorite type of perennials because that's a, a whole program in itself. But I wanted to just mention uh, a couple very briefly of care type things for a perennial garden. Now, many people ask me, how do I know when you should dig, divide, move perennials? Because some things need to be moved in the spring or you know, dug divided. Some things need to be dug and divided in the fall. For example, if a neighbor has some really good things and you want some of them or vice versa, when do you, how do you know when to move these? Well, there's an easy way to tell. When a perennial is blooming, and, and usually we can remember when perennials are blooming. We know that peonies are blooming late May, early June, okay? Mums bloom way in the fall. So, okay, uh, the most tender time on perennial, the most sensitive time is when it's in full bloom. That's the time it doesn't want its roots monkeyed with because that's very hard on it. So uh, to know when to dig, divide, move a perennial, you select the season that's opposite its bloom time. For example, uh, bleeding heart are blooming in May, early June, uh, peonies also. And so we, uh, we do any digging dividing in the season opposite, which would be in the fall. September is the time to dig and divide peonies. So take a, if we take a look at mums, which bloom in the fall, those get dug and divided in springtime. Also hosta, hosta generally bloom if, if uh, you let them uh, develop their flowers. They're usually uh, end of summer, uh, maybe even September. So those are dug and divided in the springtime. So easy way to keep in mind, just uh, choose the season opposite of their blooming time. Care of perennials in the fall of the year. Most perennial flowers survive winter better with the above ground portions left on in the fall of the year. They winter better. And also there are little pollinators, uh, native type pollinators that overwinter in the hollow stems of many perennials. So leaving them intact in place really does help our pollinator situation. Now, there are a few types, though, that we should cut back in the fall of the year. We should remove the tops. Uh, that includes um, daylily, iris, hosta. Over winter, they just turn to mush. And so it's just so much easier to remove those in the fall of the year after a, a good hard freeze. And um, peonies should be cut back all the way down to ground level or about an inch above in the fall of the year for disease sanitation, then those tops should be removed. And if you have some perennials that are a little bit borderline in hardiness, or you want to kind of push the uh, push the, your hardiness zone a little bit, protective mulch should be applied in early November after some frost is in the ground. We, we need to get the uh, ground kind of cold and then we apply protective mulch and that will prevent freezing and thawing and moderate the winter temperatures also. And just like that, we have a beautiful perennial garden. Now feel free to email me anytime. Uh, my email is there, donald.kinsler at ndsu.edu.
I'll leave that on for just a second, and then I'm going to stop sharing, and I'll gladly entertain any questions that we have. Thank you, Don. We've got quite a few questions here. What's a good guide to determine if a garden area is sun or shade? Oh, good guide. Okay, so, um, sometime we take these things for granted. So uh, full sun is considered about eight hours of di good direct sunshine. Uh, so observe, and about four to six hours is part sun, part shade. And if it's getting four hours or less, then it's considered shade. Can we use wood chip mulch in an iris bed to discourage weeds? Yes. Uh, now, um, to discourage weeds, uh, wood chip mulch or shredded bark, uh, it needs to be either really thick, such as five to six inches, or you need an underlayment underneath. And something such as iris or peonies, we can't get too thick right up around it. Otherwise, they get kind of smothered and rotting. So uh, wood chips, shredded bark, but put some underlayment under it. Like I say, I like cardboard. You know, talking about wood chip mulch, out in the country, the wind blows like crazy. Uh, do you got any tips on how we can manage that? I actually like shredded bark uh, better than wood chips. And there's kind of a difference. Sounds like the same pro product. But sh uh, the shredded bark, shredded wood is more like slivers of wood. Uh, and they mesh together better. The actual chunks of wood do tend to blow and float around. So they're actually two separate products. And so I'm a big fan of the shredded instead of chipped. Okay. This person has... Out on the farm, his dad's got a 70-year-old peony bush. Can you, you think he can transplant some of that bush? Yes, absolutely. Lots of people have moved uh, their grandparents, great-grandparents' peonies off of the homestead. To uh, Yep, and so the main thing is just do it in September, around Labor Day. Okay, Don, you've inspired a person here, at least one, that's for sure. And he wants to put in a perennial garden. How does he get started? Okay, first thing is to decide where you'd like, uh, maybe start small with the idea of expanding, then you can keep uh, the weeds out under control. So first thing would be, if it's in a grassed area, you'll need to get rid of the grass, and then go from there. So assess what your light sunlight situation is, and start small and expand. You know, as, when people look for types of perennials available, like out in Fargo, how do they how do they find out? Is there catalogs or magazines or how can you find out where a perennial is found? Yeah, well, I really like the locally owned garden centers uh, as opposed to the national chains because national chains are sending truckloads kind of across the United States. So I find the the best perennials generally at the locally owned garden centers. They tend to be the special named varieties. You know, I can't find buttered popcorn at the chain stores, the Daylily, but I can find it at local owned garden centers. Um, so we can browse catalogs and, and there are many good mail order catalogs uh, on perennials. Um, so check with, uh, if, if you know some really good gardeners in the area, check with them for some of their sources for their best mail order uh, catalogs and then shop the locally owned. Don, how do we keep weeds out of the perennial garden? Ah, that's a wonderful idea <laughs> or a wonderful concept, a wonderful question. How do you keep weeds out? Okay, um, a couple of ways. The preen weed per, uh, preventer, the granules in the uh, yellow and red box, that is a weed preventer. It will prevent weed seeds from sprouting. It won't uh, prevent weeds that are coming up from a perennial root. So it won't uh, uh, keep away um, quack grass, uh, thistle, you know, et cetera. And so a person has to be diligent with the hoe and the knife cutting them out. Uh, some things such as quack grass can be separated out of some perennials with a product called Grass Be Gone. And so uh, use a combination of mulch, uh, hand weeding, and um, do some investigating or email me about some products, chemicals that can be used. Chemicals need to be used with great caution. John, you mentioned there's such things as short-lived and long-lived perennials. How can, what's, how can we determine, how, or is there a source of information for that? Or? Yeah, and uh, I should uh, back 
backtrack just a little bit on the weed control. Weed control is probably the greatest challenge with the perennial with perennial growing. And yeah, and we all work and struggle at that. Okay, so how to tell the difference between long-lived and short-lived? Uh, the long-lived perennials, um, yeah, you can, you can do a, an online search because um, there are some really good websites. If you simply do an online search of long-lived perennials and short-lived perennials, you'll find some good um, good solid information. I always put the word university behind my search. Um, long live perennials, university. And then you'll come up with some really good information from our various universities on those. So that's that's where I would find the information. Just search both, both and put university behind it. Okay. How about, is there good perennials that will work well mixed with roses? Yes. Yeah. Um, in fact, any, uh, since roses love sun, full sun, full all day sunshine, or at least uh, most day sun with a little bit of afternoon shade. So uh, almost any sun loving perennials will work well with roses. Make sure you give the roses enough space so the perennials aren't competing uh, sun ways. So if, this, if you want to start with roses and you never grew one before, what one would you recommend? Ah, uh, with roses. My favorite are those developed in Canada. Uh, the uh, Canadians had a great breeding program. There's the Morden series. Um, and But there's a, a lot that are even better than that series. One of my favorites is called Campfire, beautiful rose. And... Um, so anyway, the where I find a list of that, I, I simply put in uh, roses developed in Canada. And then a wonderful list comes forth of these types like Canada. Uh, there's one called Canada Blooms. And I, I really love those Canada roses. They're, they're the hardiest uh, that I've ever grown. Is there a, how do we find out which ornamental grasses are hardy in zone three? Uh, ornamental grass is hardy in zone three. I believe uh, University of Minnesota. Um, check. Uh, University of Minnesota has a really nice website on ornamental grasses. So if a person simply check ornamental grasses, University of Minnesota, and that site lists the hardiness zones also between zones three and four, because some are zone four and a little bit borderline for zone three. Do any hostas grow in full sun? There are. Yep. And that's where the descriptions, either in a plant catalog or on the plant tag at the garden center, will tell. Uh, if they don't say grows well in full sun, we can be fairly assured that they should be in shade. If if full sun is is one of their advantages, it will usually sell say that as a selling point. So, okay. but there are definitely some that do very well in full all day sun. And what's your favorite perennial daisy for North Dakota? You know, I, I still like the Shasta type daisy because there are the white uh, daisy, big white daisy with the yellow center, because there are some new varieties that are a little uh, shorter, more dwarf, um, bloom more, longer. And so I, I like the Shasta daisy. Okay. How about if we use wood mulch around the house? Is that a concern that our house is going to burn down someday? Not usually. Perennials like uh, that's a good, good question. That's a great question. Uh, we we don't want. I don't want to be the cause. Of, what a I don't want to be the cause of of, of, of any house fires. Um, but um, what what happens with the mo with the wood mulch is it starts to decompose. It stays fairly moist and. Um, and so I've never heard of a house fire. And I know in my own use, uh, where you're keeping it moist enough, um, I've never heard of that being a concern. Yeah. And uh, oh. yeah. How about uh, when you use wood chips, are you worried about introducing diseases into your perennial bed? No. Um, wood mulch seems to be such a natural plant friendly natural plant friendly uh, material that it seems perennials just thrive in it uh, versus open exposed soil. Uh, there is one interesting thing though. If your house is sided with white siding, there is a, uh, there is a fungus that will grow, grow called artillery fungus that can throw off little black items that will 
that will stain white siding. And it, uh, that fungus doesn't hurt the plants, but if you, uh, if you have white siding, um, then I've heard people using maybe pine needle mulch instead. Because I, I have a, I got, got some re reports of people wondering, what are these little black specks on my siding? All oh, right. Called about, artillery fungus. What kind of edging do you recommend for a perennial garden? Plastic, brick, or you know, something? I like I like again. It's it's personal preference. I like recycled bricks. Uh, sometimes a person can find um, bricks from a building that was taken down, and those make really really nice natural type edging. A uh, plastic edging sometimes can pop up out of the ground over time, and so it isn't quite as long lasting. So I. Uh, like something a little more, um, a little more permanent, but also the edging shouldn't be overly visible because it's the perennials that are the feature and not the edging. Okay. Um, you know, we've uh, got any tips about keeping the grass, that beautiful sweeping grass you talk about. How do we keep that out <laughs> of the garden? Yeah. How do you keep that out of there? Well, you know, uh, there are grass, there are herbicides that are specific two grasses, specifically kill grasses. Uh, one is Ortho Grass Be Gone. Another is the Bonide company uh, called Grass Beater. And they will selectively kill grasses. You, of course, don't want to get it on your ornamental grasses, but you can spray those products right over the tops of an actively growing peony or other broadleaf type um, perennial. And they're slow acting, but they will take grasses, the lawn grass or uh, quack grass, out of perennials. Okay, last question. This person is using that cardboard mulch method you talked about as he's trying to turn his lawn into a garden. Do you suggest anything different when you plant native perennials since there was an established lawn underneath? No, I think uh, I don't think I don't know of anything specific that I would do. Um, natives, yeah, there's a great tent for, uh, to natives, of course, because they're um, so well adapted to our soil conditions. But I don't think there would be anything else in transitioning a lawn to natives. I don't think there's anything else that I believe you'd need to do. Okay, Don, thank you for your talk tonight. It was just so beautiful. Thank you, Tom, so and thank beautiful you, everyone. Flowers. Wow. Okay, that's it for tonight, everybody. But uh, the Spring Fever Forums continue. And we will be next week, we're going to focus on having a healthy environment. We're going to talk about how to manage um, pests, insect pests in flower gardens. We're going to learn about bee lawns. That's lawns that can attract pollinators and feed pollinators. And then also we'll learn about soil and organic matter. So we'll see you all next week at the Spring Fever Garden Forums. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.